going to be covering sections 2, 3, and 2, 4. It's called lines and slope. One thing we will not be covering in class from section 2, 4 is um, you're not responsible for average rate of change. Okay, so in section 2.4, average rate of change. That will be the one topic from 2.4 we won't cover in today's material. So you won't be responsible for that on, on any assessment that you have. Don't forget I've changed the syllabus. Uh, quiz 2 is on Wednesday instead of Friday. So I think everybody that wasn't here on Friday is here today. So note that classes 9, 10, 12, and 13. And don't forget to come early if you need or want more time. Sometimes people don't need more time, but just psychologically they feel more relaxed if they come in and they know they have plenty of time. Okay, so you can get here as early as 8 o'clock on Wednesday for that if you want. I'll be here with the quiz already. All right. So I want to remind you that the four problems that you had on piecewise functions the other day, you had four problems as a group activity. I have the answer key up here. And before you get the answer key, I need to see that you've made a good attempt at all four. You don't have to get them correct, but I have, I have to see that you've at least made an attempt to do them. Um, and then I'll give you the answer key. You don't get a lot of practice in your homework to, with drawing uh, piecewise functions. What they do is they give you graphs and you have to pick them. So it's a little bit um, misleading in the sense that you should know how to draw a piecewise graph and that's why we've given you so much practice of really very, they, they move on up in terms of their difficulty. So if you can get through this um, group activity fairly successful or at least try it and then go over the answer key and understand it, you're, you're pretty well set for piecewise functions. So um, I will give you one of these when you bring up your group activity and show me that you've tried it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we, we didn't cover the greatest integer function the other day. Um, so I would like to do that at some point today. So from lecture 13, we skipped a little part because we were running out of time. So I'll, I'll go back and do that with you today. So I think today is going to pretty much be a review for many of you. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to work your way through these problems up to, up to two. I'll give you like five or ten minutes and then I'm going to start in talking with you about problem number two, the point slope form. So just put up your flag if you have any questions about the material that's uh, in number one. Okay, so in these four problems you have if you have any um, lack of confidence at all in your ability to subtract positive and negative numbers to find the slope, you can at least count the spaces between the points um, because you have the graph available to you. So the first thing that's important is that you at least graph your, your um, points correctly in order to find the slope. So we got negative 4, negative 2 because that will definitely mess you up. And you connect these two with a straight line. Okay, it's pretty steep there. And you can use your formula. It says the slope is the change in your y value, which is your dependent variable over the change in your independent variable. So 4 take away a negative 2. 4 take away negative 2 becomes 6. And then the corresponding x value is right below them. Negative 3 take away negative 4 is 1. Or you could just take a walk from point, say, point A to point B, and you'd walk to the right one, and you'd have to walk up six units. So there's your six to one. There's your slope. Similarly, with this problem, I would, if I had the graph right in front of me, I would at least graph every each point, and that would help me to determine, um, I used to have a ruler there, that would help me to determine whether the sign should be negative or positive anyway. So I would just do a quick sketch. And again, you, to go from 5 down to negative 2, you'd be dropping 7 units, and you'd be going to the right 5 units. So your slope is negative five, 7 over 5. Mathematically, you would do that again, the change in the y's over the change in the x's. 
you get negative 7 fifths. And it doesn't matter whether you say 7 over negative 5. It doesn't matter where you put the dash, the little negative sign. Any questions on those? Okay, next you've got what kind of line? What kind of line we've got here? Horizontal line. And I could ask you, how much are you rising as you walk along this line? Zero. So it has a slope of zero, and that's because your y values do not change at all for all of these points. No matter what two points you pick, whether you pick the y-intercept or some other point, the change in your y is 3 take away 3, and the change in your x really doesn't matter what it is because you have zero in the numerator, so that gives you zero for a slope. The next one, however, is a problem. And one thing you can say to yourself is, I would ask yourself, is this picture of the blue line a function? No, it doesn't pass the vertical line test. If I drop a vertical line down through this vertical line, I touch it in an infinite number of points. So right away, something is awry ar right here. You should expect something different. Here you have a change in y value. It really doesn't matter what it is, whatever it is. doesn't matter. But your change in x is 0 because your x values stay all the same. And this is undefined. So this has no slope or undefined slope. No is different than 0. 0 is a number. So you could use the word no slope or undefined slope. OK. I'll let you answer this for yourself. And now let's go on and look at um, a couple of possibilities here. This is just a summary of what you just found. Uh, positive slopes, negative, zero, and undefined. This is directly from your book. And we already talked about which of these graphs do not represent a function in its vertical lines. Vertical lines. That's why whenever we ask for an equation of a line, we should always say a non-vertical line because or a function, a linear function, because vertical lines are not functions. All right, so you have basically three forms, three, of representing a straight line. One is called point slope. This really is the one you're not as familiar with as the chorus line effect y equals mx plus b. Whenever I ask students for what the equation is for a line, it's like a chorus. Everyone says y equals mx plus b like that's the only thing you've left algebra with in your mind. There are two other ways to represent a straight line. This way, actually, the point-slope form is very useful, particularly when we start looking at other functions like quadratic functions, exponential functions. Being familiar with this particular form is going to help you as we go through the course. So I want to try to, if you're sort of like really attached to y equals mx plus b, I want you to try to expand your repertoire here. You know, try a few notes higher or lower than your normal range and look at this point-slope form. So the thing that makes a straight line straight is that it has a constant rate of change between any two points called the slope. That's what makes it not a curve. If I choose my two points to be two specific points on a line, let's call them x1, y1, which is, would be a fixed point, and then we keep the other point arbitrary, and we call it xy. To get the slope, I would be looking at y take away y1 over x minus x1. So we're all familiar with the slope formula. So if I now solve, this is what we say. We say that this formula is solved for m because it equals m. So we say this particular formula is solved for m. So right now it's solved for m. And what I want to do is I want to solve it. Let's solve it for the change in the y values. So what I want is y take away y1 equals something. Okay, so I want to solve it for the change in the y. And to do that, I have to multiply both sides by x minus x minus 1. Okay, x minus x1, both sides. Okay, so if I do that, I get the change in my y's equals my slope times the change in my x's. That's what we call the point-slope form. You can see that you have the slope and you have the point x1, y1. So this is really, really helpful if you happen to know the slope of a line and one point on that line, you just throw it right into this formula and voila, you have your equation. Okay. 
So let's take a look at how we would use this to uh, find the equation for the following lines. Write an equation in point-slope form of a line that meets the following conditions. And then we want you to solve each equation for y. Okay, so first, point-slope form. It's not anything new you have to memorize, folks. It's just a point. It's just your slope formula. Solve for your change in y's instead. And you put in one specific point, y1 and x1. So where we see m, we replace it with 6, because it says the slope is 6. And where we see y1 and x1, we replace it with these two values. x1 is 2, and y1 is negative 5. So where I see y1, I replace it with a negative 5. And where I see x1, I replace it with a 2. Okay, with a 2. And now I just solve this equation. y plus 5 equals 6x minus 12. So that's the equation of the line in point-slope form. You could leave it like that, but if you notice your direction, say, then solve the equation for y. So I subtract 5 from both sides, and I get 6x minus 17. This is the form you're more familiar with, your y equals mx plus b. So this is your point-slope, because you have a point in the slope, and this is slope. And it's the point that you have on y equals mx plus b is your y-intercept, because negative 17 is the value for y when x is 0. So we call this the slope-intercept form. Okay, they're exactly the same equation. They just give you different bits of information. Okay. So I'd like you to try uh, this. do the same thing here. What are you going to have to do on b first before you can use? You have to find your slope first on b. And then you can use one of the, the point slope formula. Okay, so try that one at your seats. This is not a bad idea, especially if you tend to have make arithmetic errors with your subtracting the positive and negative numbers, just to have a quick sketch. So I think everybody successfully found negative five, at least everybody that I looked at. So then it's just a question of throwing that information that you have into your point slope. So the first place you substitute for is m. m is negative 5. Remember, you have to come up with an equation, folks. So that's why you keep a y generic and an x generic. And then you just plug in one of those points. You just pick one. It's, it doesn't matter which one you pick because both of these points lie on the line. So it doesn't matter. So I happen to pick here my first point. And the only mistake I see students make a lot is, remember, the order here is x1, y1. That's the order in your ordered pair. But in your actual equation, the y1 comes first. So you just got to be careful to, to substitute for the correct values. So y take away y1 is y take away negative 1. That becomes y plus 1. x take away x1 becomes x take away negative 2. That becomes x plus 2, and when I use my distributive property, I get negative 5x minus 10. That's the point-slope form. You could circle that, and then we ask that you put it into solve for y, which is the slope-intercept form, so you subtract 1 from both sides. Okay. Any questions on that, getting either of those two? Okay, so let's take a look at what's next. Okay, so this is the one you're more familiar with, the slope-intercept form of a line. Um, so this is written for uh, a line that has slope n, m, and a y-intercept 0b. So b is used here to represent whatever the value is of your y-intercept. So your slope-intercept form is the one that you more traditionally know, y equals mx plus b. So you can see here that if x is 0, if I put 0 in for x, y is equal to b. So this is your y-intercept, the value of your y-intercept. This is your slope. So that's why it's called slope-intercept. So students uh, work um, back and forth with these two um, equations. 
The one thing you can tell right away from this equation is you know your slope and you know where it hits the y-intercept. You know that automatically. So students say, do I have to use that point slope or can I use this all the time? Well, the, as I said, it's good to get into the habit of using point slope. You could use this to do the same problem right here. Find an equation of a line that has slope 6 and passes through this point. You could still use this equation by going like this. You could say, okay, my slope is 6, and now I have to solve for b. So the only way I can solve for b is to fill in, I have 1, 2, 3 unknowns here. I don't know what y is, I don't know what x is, and I'm solving for b. So you... So we could go back here and we say, okay, 2, negative 5 is a point that it goes through. So where I see y, I have negative 5, and where I see x, I put 2, and then you can solve for b. So you have negative 5 equals 12 plus b, b equals negative 17. The only problem that I see with using this approach is sometimes students stop there and they never fully put the equation of the line back together again. So now you have to go back and say, okay, so the equation for my line is this. So you have to put your information back in. That's the only problems that I see with this, really. Okay, so again, these are all interchangeable, all of these forms. And then the general form of a line. So you want to read this for us, uh, Doug? Who's theatrical? Are you going to be theatrical for us, Doug, a little bit? Oh, who's going to be theatrical when they read this? Because this is this needs a little theater. This. Okay, Tony, I know you want to do this. Ah. Uh... There's a third form for the equation of a line other than point slope and slope intercept. Seriously, another one. Yeah, I'm kidding. General form of the equation of a line is ax plus by plus b equals four. Luckily, this form is equivalent to the other form. Solve this equation. Okay, so the third equation is, no, you did a great job, thank you. The third equation almost looks a little bit like a quadratic in the sense that everything is thrown over to one side of the equation and we set it equal to zero. So in other words, what, someone give me one of the equations we just solved. What was it? Y equals 6X minus 17. Was that one of them? Okay, so if we wanted to take the slope intercept form and put it into that form, all we would do is move all of your terms to one side of the equation. You're solving it for zero. So this would be negative 6x plus y plus 17 equals zero. So that's what it would look like. These two equations are equivalent. I subtracted 6x from both sides and I added 17 to both sides. So these equations are equivalent. Now, why would you want to use the general form? Well, the general form is helpful in graphing equations, graphing linear functions. And let's take a look at how it can be helpful. So let's suppose we were asked to graph this equation, this linear equation. Now, most of you are just automatically going to put this into your point-slope form, right? That's what you're going to do. So you're going to solve this for y, and then you're going to use the information to graph the line. But one way to use this without doing that, again, don't be a, what is it, a one-trick pony. You know, have some flexibility. Another way to graph this line is to use your x and y-intercepts. Look what happens. If I want to know my y-intercept, my y-intercept is when x is 0. The minute I put a 0 in there, boom, I already automatically know what y is. y has to be negative 2. So I have a point. Do your x-intercept. When y is 0, I know x has to be negative 4. So I can get two points very quickly and graph this line. Okay, so you can graph this by finding the x and y intercepts, or you can graph it by putting it into the y equals mx plus b mode. Okay, so go ahead and try graphing this, this straight line. Okay, so if you're given, 
if you get if you're given a graph in general form where everything's on one side you always have a couple of choices actually three but you have two fairly easy ones to ways to graph it again don't fall into the the trap of feeling like you always have to change it to y equals mx plus b because this form lends itself to finding both the x and y intercept very quickly so to find the y intercept here you say let x be 0 and solve for y so I get my points all set up before I start because I know the coordinates of these points one of the ordered one of the um, coordinates has to be 0 so let x be 0 and then solve for y 6y plus 12 equals 0, 6y equals negative 12, y is negative 2. So 0, negative 2 is a point on that line. And I say, good, now I'm going to find the other easy point when it's in this form. The other easy point is to let y be 0 and solve for x. So I let y equal 0 and I solve for x. So I get 3x plus 12 equals 0 because my 6y is gone. When y is 0, 6 times 0 is just disappears. It's 0. So 3x plus 12 is 0. x has to be a negative 4. So I'm at negative 4, 0. And now I have enough information to connect those two points with a straight line. So I'm done. So in general form, this is really the easiest method for graphing because in getting the form 3x plus 6y plus 12 into equals 0 into the y equals mx plus b there's a couple of opportunities for you to make a mistake so why go through all that work when you can easily pick these two points so sometimes we want to work for efficiency in mathematics and to do that you need to have some flexibility between um, your strategies. So if you insist on solving this thing for y, you would subtract 3x from both sides. Then you would subtract 12 from both sides. Again, you can see it's a lot more work. Then you're not even done because now you have to divide each and everything on both sides of your equation by 6. And you get y equals negative 1 half x minus 2. Now remember, a slope of negative 1 half can be written this way or it can be written this way. It doesn't matter where you put the dash. So you go to the point that you know, which is your y-intercept. That's the same point you have over here. And now you use your recipe that your um, slope gives you to find another point. So my slope here says I can go down 1 and to the right 2. I can go down 1 and to the right 2. Or what else does it tell me? It tells me I can go to the left 2 and up 1. To the left 2 and up 1. So there are three points. They all line up so I know I didn't make any mistakes. And I draw my straight line. And both of those lines are exactly the same. Well, I actually should go through, if I did it more accurately, through negative 4, 0. Okay. So graphing straight lines, again, have some flexibility. Uh, try different methods. I encourage you when you do your homework to try a different couple of uh, ways to solving, to graphing it. Any questions on either of these two methods? Okay. So we looked at these two lines earlier, and equations for horizontal and vertical lines are constant. We call these constants, right? Because constant equ equations that are equal to a constant. There's no two variables in here and, I, and they have a special form and students always say but I get them mixed up and I say don't try to memorize them just visualize a horizontal line if I ask you what's true about any point on this horizontal line what's the same about any point what's constant here what would you tell me the slope is zero what about the co coordinates of all the points what's the same the y is 3, right? Every single one of these points, the y is 3. If you can say it, you can write the equation. y is 3. y equals 3. 
you're done. That's the equation for that line. No work at all. You just say what the constant coordinate is. Now when we look at the vertical line, we know this is not a function, but it is an equation for a line and we can come up with an equation. So if you look up and down that line, what's true about every single point on that line? X is always negative 3. X is always negative 3. If you can say it, you can write the equation. So you don't have to memorize any junk in your head. It's already cluttered up with enough junk. Just visualize it or draw it and then say what the equation is. All right. So the last um, type of things we're going to cover with lines is the idea of parallel and perpendicular lines. And parallel lines are sort of the easy ones in the sense that if you have two lines running alongside each other forever and ever and they never intersect, so in other words, in this particular case, the blue line and the red line, as you move from left to right, are increasing at the same rate, then we call these parallel. Parallel lines have exactly the same slope. The only difference is where do they cross the y-intercept. So if you're comparing the equations for parallel lines, y equals mx is the same for both of them. The difference is the plus b. So that's you use the information that slopes are equal to solve um, questions involving parallel lines. So let's take a look at this one right here. How would we get going on this? Write an equation of a line passing through negative 2, 5. So right away I would stop right there. And I would say, I'm going to get an idea of where this point is. Negative 2, 5 is right here. Okay, I'm going to want an equation for a line going through that point. Now, right now, I have an infinite number of lines that can go through a single point. So that's not very helpful to me just yet. So I know that there's going to be some line going through that point, but i got to know something else. I either need to know another point, right, in order to, to graph it, or what else would I need to know? The slope. So I need to know the slope of the line going through that point. So let's see. They don't tell me the slope of the line, but they tell me a feature about the line. They tell me that the line is parallel to this line. So this is another line entirely. y equals 3x plus 1. Even though it doesn't ask me to do it, I'm going to just quickly graph 3x plus 1. Here's 3x plus 1 y equals 3x plus 1. So I want the line that goes through this point and is parallel to that line. Okay. So I know this point. Do I know the slope of this black line? Do I know the slope of this black line? Two people said yes. This black line is parallel to this green line. The slope of the green line is 3. So I want the slope of the line. So all you need to do is rewrite your question. You're looking for an equation of a line that passes through. I know you won't bother writing these, but I'm going to just write it for you. That passes through that point and has a slope of 3. Because it's exactly the same as that. Now, you just did a bunch of those problems at the beginning of the hour. So you could, you, you could do this by using your point-slope formula right here. Because you know the slope and you know a point. Or you could use y equals mx plus b, whatever you want to do. Right? But that's how you would approach this. Okay, so you can finish that off in a minute. I just want to cover perpendicular lines for you. Perpendicular lines aren't as easy as parallel lines. And what you notice here with perpendicular lines, the first thing you should notice is that the lines go in opposite directions. So the slope of perpendicular lines will have different signs. One will be positive and one will be negative. And then the other change is that notice the slope of the blue line is A over B. Vertical distance change over the horizontal. The slope of the red line is the opposite of B over A. So not only are the slopes different signs, they're reciprocals of each other. Okay, so when you get a question like this, find the slope of any line that passes 
whose equation is find the slope of any line that's perpendicular to this equation, you first have to find the slope of this line, slope first, and then the slope of the line perpendicular to that will be the negative reciprocal. Okay. So you work on those two things, A and B. Have you seen? So what did we get for this first one? Did anybody have the equation for the line in point-slope form? Just point slope form, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Anybody have that equation? Yeah, Tony? Y minus 5 is x. Y minus 5, because you pluck out y1 right there. 3 times x minus plus 2. OK, and that's fine. That's as far as you have to go. You don't have to go any further Okay, when it, when it asks you to put it in point slope form. What's the advantage of this? You should be able to train your eyes to look at this and say, I know when I look at this equation, my slope is 3, and I go through the point negative 2, because look, my formula is written with a subtraction. So if you see a plus 2 there, you know that it's subtracting negative 2, that it goes through negative 2, comma 5. So you know the slope and a point on your line automatically, just from looking at this equation. This goes through um, the point negative 2 comma 5. OK, and then if you put it into y uh, equals mx plus b, you have to use your distributive property and then add 5 to both sides, and then you're all set. So this is the slope-intercept form of your line. All right, so find the slope of any line perpendicular to this line. This line is in general form. and you do not know what the slope of this line is right now from looking at this. You have no idea. Because the only way you know the slope is if it's in one of these two forms right here, which is has the word slope in its name. This is a general form. So there's nothing you can tell from this except for your x and y intercepts. That's all you can tell. So you solve this for y by subtracting x and adding 12 to both sides as your first step. And then you divide each and everything on both sides of your equation by 3. And this gives you y equals negative 1 third x plus 4. So now you can look at this and say the slope of this line is negative 1 third. The slope of the line perpendicular to it, to this, is the negative reciprocal. I have to change my sign so it's going to be positive and I take the reciprocal of 1 third, which is 3 over 1, or 3. So the slope of any line perpendicular to this is 3. OK, so let's um, finish today's off with uh, rate of change. Uh, and this isn't any different than anything we've done, except for now you're going to put in the meaning. This is when slope has a meaning. So in the year 2000, the year 2000, the average price of gas was $1.93, adjusted for inflation. In 2011, the average price was $3.53. Assuming the price of gas increases linearly, which it doesn't, it fluctuates, it's not a straight line. We're assuming that it increases linear, linearly, which means it would change at a constant rate from either day to day, month to month, or year to year, which it doesn't. Find an equation that, uh, that models the price of gasoline, G, given T, measured as years since, 19, years since 2000. Interpret the slope of your equation as a rate of change. OK. So the first thing we need to do is we need to change these coordinates here, because we're not going to start with 2000. We're going to start with the year 2000. So my first point will be 0, 1.93. And what will be the coordinates of my second point? 11, 3.53. So to find my slope, my slope now has a meaning. Don't use y and x, because we're not using y and x anymore. We're looking at the change in g over the change in time. So 3.53 minus 1.93, these have dollar signs on them. So I would recommend right now you put your units in, because then it makes it really easy to interpret. So those are dollars. And on bottom, I have 
11 minus 0 and years after it, years after 2000. So that's what I'm going to put. What, 353 minus 193, I think if I'm still doing my math right, is $1.60. Is that correct? Thank you. Someone did it. Divided by 11 equals, what does it equal? $1.60 divided by 11. Nobody has that done? 14.14. Okay, let's, oh, this is really big today. Woo, all right. Let's turn this on. One point, ah, second quit. Ah, get out of there. Okay, 1.6 divided by 11. So this says, right now, this is not a unit rate. It says over 11 years, my price increase was, on average, was $1.60. Notice I have my units right there. So to interpret this, it's no problem. When I change it to this, 0 0.145, with the 4.5 repeating over 1, you don't see the 1 in the bottom, but put it in so you can put your units in. This is dollars. This is years after 2000. So this is now called a unit rate. So to interpret that, I could say that gasoline prices increased, on average, 14 and a half cents per year. 14 and a half cents per year. Okay, so notice I'm using both numbers, the 0 0.145 over 1. I'm going to actually do this like this. I'm going to take that, I'm going to make it an approximate because it's easier to interpret. So on average, my gas price, my gasoline prices increased 14 and a half cents or 0.145 dollars, however you want to say it, per year. It's either 14 and a half cents as my unit or 0 0.0145 dollars per year. So what I'd like you to do now is get working on the fraying knot, which has to do with relationships and marriages in the U.S., and you'll have lots of practice to working out these equations.